Hi, I'm Susie Larson. Thanks for listening to this podcast from Susie Larson Live. It's only just a matter of... Welcome to Suzy Larson Live. Always so honored to get to spend this time with you. In fact, I look forward to bringing you conversations every single day that hopefully inspire you in your faith walk, that deepen your understanding of God's Word, and that heightens your awareness of His very real presence in your life. Well, you know this if you listen often enough. We like to start every show every day talking Scripture. God's Word is living. It's active. It's powerful. And there's always something to gain when you ask somebody, what is God talking to you about out of His Word? It's refreshing and encouraging to hear how His Word is working in people's lives. So over the next hour, you'll hear from a number of past guests of the show who share about their time studying the Word and a passage they wanted to share. First, we'll hear from Vice President of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, Tom Phillips, as he reflects on the fact that God is still speaking to us today. Well, of course, as you have just shared, darkness. In the midst of darkness, we need revelation. And the scripture that jumps out at me is really entitled, actually, in the King James Bible, God's Supreme Revelation. God, this is Hebrews chapter 1, just the first couple of verses, God, who in various times or times past and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his purpose, person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of his majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels. So as we think about Jesus, it's not a historic figure that once spoke, even though the Word of God is his Word. He can still speak. He speaks to the human hearts today. And many people have said what we're going through in terms of awakening is like a baby in the birth canal coming out of the womb. Everything's cared for. Everything's provided. You're warm. You're refreshed. You're secure. You hear your mother's heartbeat. And then all of a sudden, you're, you're in this tunnel, and uh, you're, just, you're just pressurized, and it's very frightening. A uh, baby always comes out crying, of course, and um, in the midst of that darkness that we're in, God does speak. He speaks through the Word that we've heard in our lives. He speaks through the care of other people. He speaks to our brains because He made them, and uh, I feel that right now, all of the indicators of Charles Finney, the seven that he wrote down the great revivalists of the 1800s, all of those indicators to know when God is coming, when God is moving, uh, are operative today, today, wow. and in wow. a very vital way in the midst of the mess. And we, we are in a mess. There's not a single positive institution in our nation, from the nation itself, the Constitution, the family, the educational system, the medical system, the banking system, Uh, Even the agricultural system, the the food industry system, the medical system, not one is not being attacked. The Bible tells us very clearly that Satan, when thrown out of heaven, was cast to earth while he's here. And uh, he has a few minions working with him. But we know that the victory is Jesus Christ and the peace that comes from him. And he says, I speak. And, you know, in the past, when Jesus spoke, he spoke in context. For, for example, in Elijah, he spoke with a still, small voice. In Isaiah, he used a large tablet, and, and he rewrote in the common language, the Bible says. Jeremiah, uh, he actually he used visual arts. He broke a vase and used that to speak. Ezekiel, he talked about the anatomy. He spoke to dry bones. In Daniel, the finger on the wall, he wrote to people. So God is speaking to us today in the context of this absolute mess. We think of people like Reese Howell and others who help pray nations through devastations and world wars, and uh, it's all about the kingdom of God. And so God himself says, this is my son. Listen to him. So Jesus, I believe, is giving us a final communication. This is a time of destiny. It's a time of end times where good and evil are fighting. And um, Satan's best ploy to hurt 
the father, and Lucifer was one of the chief angels who had to be cast out. And there must have been a really good relationship between them at one time. And he's all about destruction. He wants to hurt his father. The best way is to take his father's chief creation, which is the child of God, and destroy them, whether they know the Lord or not, just to wipe out every human being. And we hear the evil side even today talk about depopulation. And God is talking about how to raise a proper family, how to reproduce, how to have Mm. the proper training for our children, how to have the proper food, how to take care of his planet. One of the things I run into periodically, and I think this is part of revival, people look at segments of society and say, that's not spiritual. Excuse me. Our father made this whole planet. When you go back to Genesis, he made the birds, he made the plants, he made the animal, he made the darkness, he made the light, he made the terra firma. He made the skies above. He made the layers of the heavens. Everything is our Father's. He cares about every single thing. And when we hear people say, well, I'm just going to live my life because Jesus will come and make it right. No, that may be true, but not the first part. God is saying, this is my creation. You are my creation. Your job, as he told Adam and Eve, is to care for this creation. Abortion is not caring for the creation. The death of someone else to provide something for you is not caring for this creation. And so I look at the Gen Z young people, like Noah, your nephew I work with. We're told Gen Z is the, what, most secular generation yet? That may be true numerically, but the young people I meet who are committed to Christ, and and I meet a lot of them, and I know a lot of them, they're like Billy Graham when he knelt on the stump at Florida Bible Institute and gave his life to the Lord for ministry and said, God, I'll go anywhere you want me to go, do anything you want me to do, be anything you want me to be, say whatever you want me to say. And that's the young generation. I mean, we have a thing at Samaritan's Purse. Franklin Graham oversees that as well, called World Medical Missions. And one of the ministries of that ministry is to doctors. They come out of medicine with $400,000 loans. And how do they ever get to the mission field? So wise men and women have pooled money, and they'll pay their loan as they work in the mission field. And I've sat across from cardiovascular surgeons, um, facial muscular surgeons, uh, ears and throat, family practice, who've given up their futures economically to go serve others. This is Jim Z. And so in the midst of the mess, we're never told, never on mainstream media that there's good going on. Um, There's great going on. Look at the love that's happened to the Bills team after Mm -hmm. the collapse of that great young player, Damar. But look Mm -hmm. at the love that's being shown. Look at the CNN, uh, I think it's Fox News, maybe ESPN reporter, saying, let me pray. The nation is being called to God in the midst of the darkness. Next, we'll hear from author Andy Andrew. Have you ever read the part of the Bible, even though you know you've read it before, and God brings it to life in a new way? That's what happened to Andy as she read in Genesis. So I have been in Genesis at the beginning of the year. I started with my daughter to jump back into Scripture with her. She's reading through the whole Bible, and I said, well, I'm going to read part of the New Testament and Old Testament with you as well. And You know, sometimes when you go back into Genesis, you're like, oh, I've read this before. But man, I had so much fun just like as God opened up this this part of Genesis 4 that deeply actually spoke to me in a moment. And it's out of Genesis 4.26. It says, at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. And so I was like, okay, at what time? So I backed up and, and was reading it. And it's at the time that Adam and Eve's grandson, Enosh, which is Seth son was born. So this is three generations since the fall, three generations of silence and pain, three generations of internalizing everything that had gone down. And I just started Mm -hmm. to go into that place where I went, wow, the generational silence of not calling on the name of the Lord when Adam and Eve used to walk in the cool of the garden with God, like they had this connection with him. And then after they were cast out, there was a silence that fell upon them. And I was thinking about that. I Honestly, Adam and Eve's pain would have seemed insurmountable. When you really go there, I mean, they were cast out of the garden, which 
when you really look at this, it was an act of mercy, you know, allowing our redemption rather than living this life of perpetual sin in an unredeemed state. But then I think about this, and you make it personal sometimes. Their first son kills their second son. Their firstborn son is then exiled. Eve gives birth to Seth again, and then Seth has a son and calls him Enosh. And only after their grandson, Enosh, is born, it says that at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. And so I was just thinking about this with myself, with my parents, with the generations that have gone by, the way that we're different in each generation, how we internalize, how we go silent, how we don't let things out, how grief sits in our body, how we don't heal. And I was thinking about how many years had gone by, how long had Adam and Eve stayed silent in their pain and their sin. And yeah, and only after their grandchild was born, born did people begin to open their mouths and cry out to God. But until then, the generations remain silent and withdrawn and internalizing. And then I thought about it. I was like, how good is this that in, um, you know, under the new covenant with Jesus that we don't have to do that. Um, And we can cry out on the name of the Lord at any time. And I realized even in my own life, as I read this uh, a couple of weeks ago, and God really started to dig down on me. He's like, hey, you're going silent and internalizing and overthinking and catastrophizing different things in your life. But you don't have to do that, Andy. The veil has been torn into the pain. You know what I mean? Like we have this full access to connect with the living God. And I guess for me, even thinking about the listeners that are, whether you're driving or folding laundry or, you know, whatever it is you're doing right now, maybe just ask yourself, like, where have you gone silent? Where have you become withdrawn and internalized in what you've been through? Or maybe what you're in the middle of, maybe you're in the need in need of a miracle um, of healing in your body and you've lost hope or reconciliation with a spouse or a child, but you've lost hope and you've gone silent and you've internalized and you've catastrophized and you've lost your faith and your hope. And I guess really for me, like this, it encouraged me so deeply reading this that I I guess in a way I want to encourage anyone who's listening to cry out to God, begin to open your mouth again. That that small thing of opening your mouth and letting out the pain, letting out the things you've internalized, whether you're driving in the car, in the shower, or wherever you are, um, share your pain with this good and present God who has gone before you to redeem and restore all things. And I guess that's the thing I would say, like, don't hold back. I think I shared it last time we were all together was when when we are wounded, um, we believe lies and then those lies become false belief systems because we internalize them that become strongholds where we make vows and say, I will never allow so and so or this organization or whatever to hurt me again. But don't internalize, like process your pain properly before God and allow there to be healing. And I just really too want to encourage people listening. I do believe that many of you listening are the generational breaker for your family line. Come on, come on. And so therefore what that means is it's like, don't be the, don't follow the same patterns, like do something different. Otherwise keep doing the same thing. You're going to have the same thing. So be that first generation, even though it's difficult, you have to keep taking the high road and doing the right thing. Be the one who is the generational breaker who cries out upon the name of the Lord that divorce stops with our family line. Addiction stops with our family line. You know what I mean? So cry out to God. Don't let don't internalize it. all. let it out. And so that's what I want to encourage everybody in because it really deeply encouraged me. Wow. As I read in wow. Genesis and saw something new. Cry out to God. Don't internalize it. Let it out. Such good word from Andy. You're listening to Suzy Larson Live, and we're listening to some of our past guests share about their time studying scripture and a passage they wanted to share. We'll hear more from great guests coming up in just a moment. This is Suzy Larson, host of Suzy Larson Live. You know, this Christmas, you can grow in your understanding of the Bible and even find new excitement in welcoming Jesus into your heart in new ways. Download your free Advent reading plan at MyFaithRadio.com. God bless you. Merry Christmas. We love you. Welcome back to Suzy Larson Live. Today we're spending the whole hour hearing from many past guests as they share about what God has been speaking to them. First, we're going to hear from three-time head and neck cancer survivor and parent of children from hard places, Michelle Cushette. 
She's talking about the Hall of Faith in Hebrews and the people who died, who would not received things had prom- they'd been promised. And know that as Michelle's talking, she's had two-thirds of her tongue removed from tongue cancer. I, yeah, I wish it was something more glamorous and um, easier. But really what he's talking to me right now uh, is uh, this idea of living in limbo with him without resolution. Uh, that there are certain things that we prayed for and asked for or that we long for, things that we uh, desperately want to be true about our lives, that uh, the truth is they may never resolve before uh, we end our lives, right? Before our days come to an end. And I kind of feel like he's, you know, leaving this question with me. Can you trust me even then? Mm-hmm. I've been spending lots of time in Hebrews 11 through um, 12, 3. So Hebrews 11, the whole chapter, and then 12 verses 1, 2, and 3. And and that is often called the hall of faith uh, because it is all these people. It's it's the the author of the book of Hebrews is talking about these people who lived with faith and what it looked like, uh, you know, kind of practically through all these different circumstances. So the author goes through people like um, Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and all of us. But one of my most interesting verses there that really sums this up is verse 13 of chapter 11. It says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And you know, we'll get into my story more in a moment, but this idea of living in this place of limbo where you are, um, you are present to what is, but the what is not yet hasn't yet come to be true. And, and often that's a place of suffering and pain and questions and, uh, you know, difficult relationships and big emotions and all of that. And the question I feel I'm asking me, can you just sit with me here, even if, things don't get wrapped up, even if uh, there's not a nice neat bow on it, even if you don't see the answers to all your prayers, can you still hang with me? Can you still cling to me? Can you still believe me? Even if you at some point in time reach the end of your life and the things aren't resolved and you just see them and welcome them from a distance. And can you trust that in this place, um, I'm not just God, but um, I'm your father and I love you. And that's Mm. man. That's easy to say, harder to do. Come on. So true. And I can't even believe you're bringing that up. Just a few hours ago, I was talking with my sister about that very passage and the problem oh. with form, formulaic faith, that that when uh-huh. there is an A plus B always equals C mentality, as if we dictate to God and he's obligated always then to abide by our formula, what do you uh-huh. do with those for whom that doesn't work? You toss them aside and you judge mm-hmm. them as having missed a step. But if you go to Hebrews, it says the world wasn't worthy of them. You know, mm-hmm. so what is it? Mm-hmm. Is it you missed a step or the world's not worthy of you, uh-huh. that your faith is so grand and so eternal that it exceeds this life and echoes into the next? And I think this is a super important conversation and wrestling that we have to mm-hmm. battle with, don't you think? Yes, we have to battle with and we have to battle with with it, knowing that there may not be an end point when the battle is done except the fact that at some point we're going to close our eyes on this life and open our eyes to the face of Christ. And that's when we'll feel the resolution, but not here. And boy, that is, you know, I'm, I love a good plan. I love to have a good plan. I like to walk out a good plan. I like to check all the boxes and see the plan accomplished. And so that's really difficult for me to stay in a place of limbo where there's not too Tylenol I can take to cure it. You know, Mm. I have to just sit with it and let it be what it is. Uh, and then the other piece of that is, can you see me as kind even in that place? Yes. Boy, that's a good question. I remember as a young believer reading that, then thinking, Lord, what good is the promise if they died without ever receiving them? What it makes it a promise if they died without mm-hmm. receiving the promise? And mm-hmm. that's where the Lord is like, I'm going to spend your life weaning you off of your attachment to this earth Because life on earth is short, eternity is long. And if there's an answer that doesn't happen in this life, because it's because it's so much more glorious in the next. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, so that it's so important to say our faith is not wasted on us or on God. Our prayers, our our offerings of trust aren't wasted on us just because we don't get what we want in the moment. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. 
you know, I've had to spend some time considering the fact that at some point in time, every single one of us will have a prayer that's not answered because we die, <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah. at some point in time, our prayers for healing are not going to be answered the way we want them to be. It's just the reality of that. Does that mean that God didn't follow through on the equation? Does it mean I failed in my prayer somewhere along the way? Or what if um, really the promise isn't an outcome, it's a person? Hmm. And if the promise, if the real promise, the fulfillment of that is a person, not an outcome, then no matter what the circumstances are, we still have the person in Jesus, right? That's, that really is where it's at. But boy, uh, like you said, our whole entire journey is a disentanglement from our attachment to ourselves and our people and our things and a reattachment of ourselves to God himself. In the fulfillment of the promise is a person, not an outcome then no matter what the circumstances, we still have the person in Jesus. Wow, what a powerful reminder. One more before we go to break. We're going to hear from author Addison Bevere sharing something new he noticed reading the story of the demoniac in the Gospel of Luke. I'm going to go to something that I just read, actually, in Luke's Gospel. And I've read this, Susie. I've read this so many times. For whatever reason, it didn't hit me the way it did Um like this it just it's never hit me like this before but it's it's the story when when jesus travels and he comes he comes to a town and there's a demoniac um that that he encounters and it's one of those curious interactions with jesus that we get a glimpse into we're like huh why did things happen the way they did where where this legion requests to be sent into the pigs and the the text actually says that they begged to be sent to the pigs and Jesus ends up granting the permission and sends this, this legion to the pigs. And then the legion drives the pigs off the cliff and into the water and they all perish. And, you know, it's, it's a story. Most of you, if you've read the scripture, you're probably familiar with, but then later there's something really fascinating that, that struck me recently. Later, we, uh, we see that this man who was a former demoniac, we see that he begs, to follow Jesus, to go with Jesus. And Luke, when Luke writes, there's, there's nothing that is um, by accident. Luke is very careful with his details. And so the fact that this beg language is used in both places is significant. And Jesus actually tells this former demoniac, he tells him that he can't follow him. This is the only time in the gospels that you'll find Jesus telling someone that he can't follow him. And then, but Jesus tells him, but actually, I want you to go and declare how much God has done for you. And this man went off and proclaimed through the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Now, as I was meditating on this, it struck me, Susan, I, I, think, I think this might resonate with some of our listeners today. It struck me why the man might have wanted to go with Jesus as opposed to being where he had been. He, he was known as the demoniac. He was known as the one who terrorized this place. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was some shame attached to that location Mm -hmm. and to that place. But Jesus says, hey, actually, I've set you free. And the freedom, this testimony that you have, what I've done, the goodness and the faithfulness that is evident in the place of your brokenness. It is the most evident in the place, the location, the home of your brokenness. I'm going to turn this thing around and you are going to be a testimony. You're going to be my disciple, even though you're not following me where I'm going. You're actually going to be someone who declares the goodness and the faithfulness of God in the place where you had, where you have uh, in the past participated in the most damage, the most breaking, the most sadness, the most destruction. And I just love that. You're going to be someone who declares the goodness and faithfulness of God in the place where you have participated in the most damage, in the most breaking. God's the Redeemer. Man, can somebody give me an amen? When we come back from break, we're going to hear from Drs. Tom Blee and Troy Spurl. Chip Ingram, and many more. Don't go away. We'll be back in a moment. Thanks for listening to Suzy Larson Live. We've been hearing from some amazing past guests of the show as they share about what God's been doing in their lives and how he's revealing himself through scripture. First, we're going to hear from ER trauma surgeon, Dr. Tom Blee, talking about what he learned from the story of the paralytic in the Gospel of John. Okay, so give me a little leeway here. This may bring us into it. the next commercial break. I think when God right. gets moving fast in a trauma surgeon's life, it's like, I got to get it all out. But uh, yeah. it something started after Christmas. My son, uh, Jack, called me, and uh, he went through a huge life transition. He made a decision about moving away from school, and actually he is a cattle ranch hand. Um, hmm. And he called me and he said, um, 
I'm reading the Bible, and I'm like, that's amazing. And he said, have you ever read the book of John? I said, yep. And he said, well, do you know the story of the woman at the well? And I, and, and I said, I do. And he started laughing. And I said, why are you laughing? He said, Jesus knew everything about that lady. And so we got into this discussion about where are we going? What wells are you going to in, in the world of COVID and everything that's happening? I think we're all asking those questions. But that stuck with me for months. And then it transitioned to discussions with your husband and he's circulating Jamie Winship's things about identity and the mm-hmm. identity in the kingdom. He's talking versus, about my hubby. Yes. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. The identity in the kingdom versus the identity of the empire. And I really started to reach in. You know, it, it, if listeners are, haven't listened to that um, podcast, you have to. That's mm-hmm. a big next step. Yeah. Um, so I'll be the first guest to buy someone else's book and give it away and promote a podcast that I'm not even on. So that's, that's exactly right. So that's a kingdom mindset right, right. there, Tom, just say. And yeah. and one thing that Jamie and his wife talk about are the two B statements in the Bible. And so yesterday I sat down and said, I want to see if it's true. You know, like Jamie says, if the Bible's true 2000 years ago, it has to be true today. So I opened the book of, of John where my bookmark was, and there's the story of the paralytic at the um, Bethesda Baths, Mm. right? And so Mm -hmm. here's this man for 38 years trying to get to the water. The angel once a day stirs up the water. The first one in gets here, he gets healed, and everyone else is kind of out of luck until the water stirs again. And Jesus comes up to him, knows everything about him, and says, you know, what's your deal? And he says, well, I'm paralyzed. I'm alone. I can't get there fast enough. I have no help. And Christ looks at him and says, well, do you want to be made well? And I've read that so many times, and it's like, well, of course he does. He wants to walk. And what Christ is saying is like, no, 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 no. I want to change who you are. Do you want to be, to be, T-O-B-E, known as made well? And I think the man's like, yep. And that's when Christ says, then get up and walk. You know, and this man presents himself to the empire the religious leaders and can't explain it. It's like, I don't know. This guy just came up to me, asked me if I wanted to be made well. And I said, sure. And now I am made well. And they can't understand it. It's two different conversations. It's a kingdom conversation of Christ entering your life Mm. versus what the empire is saying. Mm. And Jesus comes back to him and says, you know, in the synagogue, you're made well. He's like, I am, you know, but this guy can't explain it. But he's now a witness. I don't know what happened, but I can tell you this man came into my life, changed who I was. I am now known as made well. And it changed everything. And that circles around to, I think, why I'm even here today. Um, Years ago, and the story is on the podcast. You you know, you've unraveled. You you have a history, my history on these podcasts (laughs) at a, a point in my life in my own hospital where I was um, facing criminal charges. Something happened that I never did, and it was such a bad accusation that I was in jail. And I was sitting in the hospital, just getting out of jail, had to talk to my hospital and tell them what happened. So then I'm on suspension, a guarded suspension. Um, I was functionally homeless because I had to move in with my sister. And I'm in this hospital saying, I don't even know what my identity is, but I didn't put the question forward like that. I just said, okay, God, if you exist, show me your miracles and I'll write the book. And that's what happened. And so what I've learned even in this last week is God saying, you didn't come to me with, I can't walk, I can't get in the pool, I don't have friends. You asked me to change your identity. You asked me to make you a witness, to be a witness, and to make you a storyteller, to be a storyteller. And I think that's part of what I'm learning and why I'm here today. It's like, I'm a witness to what's happening in these hospitals. God's never left without a witness. Uh, Even in the book of Revelation, there's two witnesses. Mm -hmm. But every aspect of life, God has witnesses. And for me, the discussion today is like, I don't know what happened, but I'm going to tell you what I saw. And I think that's Mm -hmm. what brings it around for me today. What a difference it makes when we know our identity in Christ Every month, we have the privilege of having Dr. Troy Spurl on the show to talk about health 
in the healing process. You know, he has such a depth of knowledge of health and healing, but also a depth of soul. He's a man after God's heart and for the healing of every part of who you are, for his patience and for me. So let's listen to what he has to say about the importance of recognizing the gift God has given us in our bodies. Uh, I am going to read from 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 19. Uh, or, do you, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. And for me, uh, I've just been, during the Christmas season, I mean, we tend to, uh, a lot of people just uh, eat excessively. And a lot of the challenges that people have with their health actually stem from Thanksgiving through Christmas here in, in the United States. Mm. And uh, I, I really want people to think about, uh, during Christmas we celebrate Jesus, and, and that is a that is the gift of all gifts right there. But God has given us a gift. And it's our body, and we, it houses uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, and, and w- it's our temple. And so a lot of times, really, really good people, people who have servant hearts and who really are supporting other people, do a great job of supporting other people, but not themselves. And so they kind of let themselves, they leave themselves for last. And the reality is, it, it's important to take care of your body because you are taking care of the gift that God gave you. And you're not alone. It's just not you. For you to yeah. be have clear, clear conversations with God, it's important to have a good, healthy body. I, that's what I've seen and that's what I believe. And that's also why I think fasting really connects us to God because fasting starts to clean out a lot of the processes. It induces a, a process called autophagy that really cleans up all the debris, all of the, all of the flaky, broken down parts of our cells happens when you fast. And so through prayer and fasting, we see miraculous things that occur uh, in Scripture, and we see miraculous things that occur in in life now, uh, mm-hmm. never mind 2,000 years ago. So, so good. it's so important just to recognize for people who have a servant heart to just know that if someone gave you a, a, just the best gift at Christmas time, you wouldn't trash it. You wouldn't put garbage on it or in it or or just treat it horribly. So we have to kind of put that same level of... Uh, and even more so, uh, a higher level of respect and just love and adoration for our own body and take care of it because it is the gift that God gave us and it is our temple. Yeah, so good. You've been bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body. And that price was the blood of Jesus. You think about all he took, not only to secure our eternity, but to allow us to house his Holy Spirit. And when you think of it that way, I think for many years, Doc, that people were kind of shooing aside the health, physical health, because the world made such an idol out of health and yes. fitness yep. that we're like, we're not going to have that conversation. But thank the Lord, that conversation has re-entered the Christian conversation because it needs to. Because we want to show up and feel our best and be our best and to neglect it. I mean, it costs you in a different way. It costs you in doctor, you know, <laughs> medical bills and time lost and just a low quality of life. It's one way or another you're going to pay for it. So you might as well invest in the front end and get healthy. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because it's not it's not to get on the front of some type of uh, magazine, GQ. Do they still have magazines? I don't even know. If they still yeah. have. Okay. <laughs> it's not to get on the front of a magazine. It's to honor God. Because when you yeah. are clean and doing well on the inside and things are operating, then you're working at your max potential and and you can actually start to do the things that God has uh, uh, put tasked for you to do or, or to have, whether it be a different assignment or just the best version of you comes out. And yeah. that's what we're talking about. So you still you may you may not look like that person on the magazine, but you're healthy on the inside, and that's really what counts. Your your cellular health, and you're protecting the DNA that God gave you, and you're you're just operating more or more efficiently. Everything mm-hmm. just works better because there's not as much confusion within the body. Communication so is good. ideal. It's important for us to have love and respect for our bodies because they are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Wow, what a great reminder. Now, author and speaker Paul Angon is going to talk about the difference it can make when we focus our mind on the Lord. Yeah, uh, you know, especially as we're coming out of um, out of, out of Easter, you know, we just experienced that you know that holy season, and it really was a reminder to me. I mean, basically, what I was writing about in this book about am I paying attention to what's important? And uh, and I was thinking of a verse, uh, Philippians four eight, I believe, but it's that verse that we all know well, but. Uh, 
you know, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever is righteous, whatever is noble, you know, think about these things. And, uh, and I've really been dwelling on that verse a lot these last months uh, because really it's a call for us uh, to pay attention with intentionality, to really focus on the good things, the blessings, just the wonderful gifts that we are given every day. And yet so far too often, I know for myself, I don't receive those gifts. I, I just block them or I'm just too distracted or too busy or I'm going too fast to really notice and receive and unwrap and appreciate those gifts that I've been given every day. So I'm really trying uh, personally to really fix my mind on the things above, really focus my attention on that. And then it's amazing when I do, I see so much of it in my day, because now I'm looking for it. I'm looking for what's already there. When we fix our mind on the things above, we notice the gifts that are there for us throughout the day. It's so good. Coming up after break, we're going to hear from past guests about what the Lord's been speaking to them. Back in just a moment. Faith Radio podcasts are produced by the listener-supported ministry of Faith Radio. If you're interested in becoming a team member, a donor to this ministry, you can support the podcast anytime and donate at MyFaithRadio.com. This is Susie Larson Live. Thanks for joining me today for a special best of show featuring past guests share from what God has been teaching them these days. Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Nijay Gupta about how God is for us. Yeah, um, I've been spending time in Romans, and uh, I love I love studying Paul. Um, and there's a verse that has really stuck out to me where Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And as I've been reading scholarship and just praying over that verse, um, I've noticed the phrase, God is for us, sticking out. And there's one scholar that says, that is actually a summary of Paul's gospel, the love of God that is for us. And I've been just ruminating on that and chewing on that because in my study of early Christianity, the, the age of the apostles, they lived in a religious world of Greek and Roman deities where humans existed for the gods. Humans existed to serve the gods. Humans existed to, in many ways, be slaves of the gods. And here's a message in Paul's big letter of Romans with all these you know, lofty statements about justification and righteousness. And, and right there, uh, Paul has these beautiful words that no matter what we're struggling with, no matter what we have to persevere through, no matter who is against you on the road, in your job, um, the spirits that you're battling with, the message of the gospel, the message of the good news of Jesus Christ is God is for us. Hmm. Uh, we all have friends that are like that where, you know, I have a friend who I was with recently and um, he just dotes on me. He's an older <laughs> gentleman and, and he just, the way he looks at me and the way he talks to me, I can feel grace. I can feel wow. love and grace emanating from him and just his smile, his curiosity about my life. We don't, we only talk about once a year, but we were together and just, just the doting, right? It was a, it was a reflection to me, Susie, of this vision of the God of scripture, the, the, the father and son and spirit that is for us and with us. I, any time, that I want to share the gospel, that's what I want to tell people. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is with us and for us. Just let that in. What a reminder. God is for you. Now, authors Tom and Joanne Doyle, who have a heart for the Middle East, share with us. They were on just after Christmas. Joanne shared what she saw anew when she read and studied about the wise men coming to visit Jesus. Then Tom shares from the Psalms. Mm, oh, I love that question. 
Well, you know, I'm probably like so many of you listening. One of the things I love to do during this Advent season, even though Christmas is over and the new year has begun, I am still savoring the Christmas story. And I have just been reading through Luke 1 and 2 and Matthew 1. And each year when I I go through these stories, I ask the Lord, you know, teach me something new. God's always got something fresh in the scripture for us. And so teach me through the lives of the people that were part of that first nativity. And so many things struck me. But Susie, what really hit me this year was reading in Matthew 1. And if you remember, the wise men come and they ask Herod, you know, where is this Savior supposed to be born, the King of the Jews? And so Herod has to go to the priests and the scribes and say, hey, where's this Messiah? person? Where is he supposed to be born? And so they tell him in Bethlehem. And so, of course, the wise men go and they worship baby Jesus. Before they lay their gifts down, they worship him. But then Herod is so mad when he learns that he's been tricked and the wise men go a different way home and they don't come back and tell him where Jesus is. And so what does Herod do is is in his rage, he kills every single one of the little boys that are two years old and younger. And that just struck me in a new way. You know, here God has called Tom and I and Uncharted to work in the Middle East. And we have seen many former Muslims um, lose their life for the, the cost of Christ, you know, martyrs for Jesus. But these baby infant boys, they were the very first martyrs for Christ. Wow. And I have never thought about that mm-hmm. before. And it just struck my heart in such a profound way. You know, and Susie, we need to step into the story of Scripture to really understand something. So, you know, we have 15 grandkids, actually 14 and one on the way. And I went and I looked at, okay, so how many are two and younger? We have seven grandkids that are two years old and younger. So we would have been living in Bethlehem during that time. We would have lost seven of our grandchildren. And then that that Mm. story takes on a whole new meaning. And then living in Bethlehem, a teeny tiny town, Gosh, what about the neighbors and the family friends that also lost little baby boys and the grieving that took place and the mourning that those baby boys were the first martyrs for Christ? You know, their lives were lost so that Jesus could live and Jesus needed to live and he needed to grow up and live that perfect life. And then one day he would die on the cross um, to, you know, forgive us for our sins and be resurrected and all of that. But first, um, he needed to live. And so one day, all of us are going to step into heaven, and we are going to meet those baby boys that were martyred for Christ, the very first martyrs for Jesus. So that wow. is just, I keep thinking about that. That has just really struck my heart in a fresh way. Mm. Wow. Talk about a fresh way to look at Scripture. Thank mm-hmm. you for that, Joanne. And Tom, mm-hmm. how about you? What's the Lord been impressing upon your heart? Well, you know, I have a psalm each year, and um, this year God directed me to two of them. And one is in Psalm 48, and it's the sons of uh, of Korah. And if you remember Korah's rebellion, they rebelled against Moses, and all of the family line except a few were wiped out. But in an incredible turnaround, these men and women from that family are not only accepted back into Israel— they end up writing scripture that's canonized for us today. And so Psalm 48, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise in the city of our God, his holy mountain. And then he takes you on a visual walk through the city of Jerusalem. God is in her citadel. He has shown himself to be her fortress and I'll count her. uh, What does it say? Count view her citadels that you may tell up to the next generation, consider well her ramparts. But then this, it just hits me so powerfully. Uh, the writer says, Son of Korah, within your temple, O God, we meditate on your unfailing love. That's where he wants us to be centered, looking at his love, understanding it. Like your name, O God, your praise reaches to the ends of the earth, and your righteous hand is filled with righteousness. So, meditating on God's love. And then fast forward to Psalm 92. There's just a formula there that I never noticed before, but the writer of this Psalm, and it's for a Sabbath day, says this, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. And I thought, you know, Lord, that's what I want to do this year. Every morning when I wake up to proclaim your love first, not my aches and pains or my to-do list or whatever, your love 
and then at night, review the day and just count God's faithfulness and how he was involved in the day, how he turned things around. So proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. Proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. Wow. Next, Pastor Chip Ingram shares from the Gospel of John and Jesus' gentleness towards Peter. There is. I have, um, you know, I've been in the Gospel of John and reading through the New Testament, and I got to chapter 21, and I'm very familiar. It's where he reinstates Peter. But I think the thing that um, has hit me the most is how gently Jesus restored him. He was forgiven. We know that Jesus appeared to him earlier. Um, and, and Peter, you know, doesn't know exactly what to do. So he goes back like we all do. We default to where we feel competent. So he goes fishing. And, you know, the last time when Jesus called him, uh, he had a bad night at fishing. And if you remember the story, Jesus has put the net out on the other side of the boat. It gets full. And then he's overwhelmed. He was called with an overwhelmness of God's goodness. And when he said, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. I mean, you have just blown my mind. And I thought it was so interesting that he takes him back to that first moment. And then it says there's a charcoal fire. And if you remember carefully, when he betrayed Jesus, he was warming his hands around a charcoal file. And I just thought of how he, he, first of all, reminds him of his calling. And then they pull another big load of fish in. And, and he doesn't talk to him. He says they he bring some of the fish. He already had some on. And so they eat. And, you know, you can just feel Peter like, you know, he's with his buddies. And I'm not sure. I know I'm forgiven, but am I ever going to be useful again? I mean, w- will it ever be the same? Um, when all of us have blown it, will it, can it ever really be the same? And I think he let him then relive sensory, the, the fire. And, and then instead of telling him, he asked him questions and he let him process the journey. And, and, you know, the first one was, you know, tend my lambs. Well, that's, in other words, care for people that are very vulnerable. And then it was shepherd my sheep. And that's a leadership, give direction and vision. And, and, and then, you know, he ends with uh, tend my sheep. In other words, it's a word for being gentle and understanding the very thing. Cause Peter's a pretty strong personality, you know, you know, he's a make it happen guy, speak first, think later. Mm-hmm. And I just thought it was so gentle of how he reinstated that, you know, failures never final with God, but you have to go back to your calling. You have to face what you did. You have to really admit yeah, I, I blew it. I mean, three times, three questions, three denials. And you know, I was just thinking about, you know, my own life. And um, sometimes I, I'm not very gentle with myself. And in my really bad moments, I'm not very gentle with others. I just thought, how how kind is our God? Sometimes I think we make him out to be very, very demanding. Uh, I love Tozer's line, God's expectations are very high. Uh, or his 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 goals for us are very high, but his expectations are very reasonable. And um, it's just kind of a good reminder for me. I've just been, you know, pondering that. Don't you love how living and breathing God's Word is? Lastly, we're going to hear from Tom Rayner as he shared his renewed desire to share Jesus with people and how reading the book of Acts taught him great things. I go through a series of prayers every day, Susie, and there's been one thing that I feel like I have neglected in my prayer life, and I have neglected to ask God for opportunities to share my faith. I have proclaimed that. I've preached that. I've taught that. I've pleaded with people to share their faith, but I realize that in my own prayer life, I was not doing so. And so I've added it to my own prayer life where I just said, Lord, give me opportunities to share Jesus in a way that will be honoring to you. I go back to the book of Acts, And again and again, I love everything about the Bible, but I love everything about the book of Acts. And Peter and John were in prison. They they were told they could not talk about Jesus and their lives would be taken, or at the very least, they would be in prison. And they speak before the Sanhedrin, and they say, we cannot stop telling about what we have seen and heard at the risk of life in Acts 4.20, at the risk of imprisonment. And I wish I was there. 
I wish I, mm. I wish I had that amount of boldness. And here's the thing about it. I'm not going to have that amount of boldness in my own power and my own strength. And I have to ask for God to give me that boldness and that opportunity. So that's what he's been doing in my life. Uh, call me in a few more months and see how I'm doing. Because- <laughs> I will do that. I love it. <laughs> wow. I appreciate Tom's humility that we should check in with him to see if he's followed through. Well, may God give all of us the boldness that he gave Peter and John to speak the name of Jesus. That's going to do it for this special edition of Suzy Larson Live. What's the Lord been doing in your life? Take time to reflect on what he's done in your life, what he's speaking to you about, what he's currently doing in and through you. Take note, write it down. Man, I'd love it if you'd share it with me as well. My hope and prayer is that you found some encouragement here. I'll meet you back here next time. Thanks for listening to this Susie Larson Live podcast. These conversations are available because of listener support. You can become a supporter today at MyFaithRadio.com. To avoid missing future editions of the show, you can subscribe to the podcast now at Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. And thanks for sharing this audio link to spread the good news of the gospel and to grow the impact of the show. Thanks for listening to Susie Larson Live.